How's it going, tubers? Coming to you from sunny Manitoba. Still some clouds, but it is sunny and it's minus four. 15 degrees below normal. And they're forecasting we're going to only be about three degrees below normal in about a week. Yep, I think early next week we're supposed to have one day, one day that we get up to plus seven. All the way up until then, it's going to be around zero, plus one, minus one, almost every day. I was going to dig up some video and attach it to, uh, to one I was editing the other night, but I didn't, didn't quite get it finished. I'm going to take a video from last year around the same time. Let's see if we could compare what things look like now. This is very uncharacteristic. Flood forecasters don't even don't even have a clue, I don't think. Um, back a couple of years ago, 2011, we had some pretty bad flooding the Assiniboine River, which flows from Saskatchewan to uh, Manitoba, joins the Red right, at, right in the middle of Winnipeg. And the Assiniboine was quite bad, and they actually do have a diversion uh, where they can take water off the Assiniboine and put it into Lake Manitoba. But that caused a lot of problems because Lake Manitoba being a kind of a shallow basin, a lot of the houses and cottages are not that much high above the water level. So when the flooding got up, they had to do the typical sandbagging that they do. But then they allowed more water into the lake and ultimately a whole bunch of houses and cottages were lost people are still screaming and fighting to get compensation. Um, there used to be a guy that worked for the water stewardship or whatever. He, he was the guy that did the flood forecast, a guy named Elf Workington. The guy was brilliant. You know, he had done it for 40 years or something and knew very well. And his forecasts were over the last years of his career were spot on, you know, he, he kept us, you know, I think in 1997 it exceeded what he had said and caused some problems, but it was, the problems were caused by man-made things like uh, breaching roads to allow water to drain into other fields and that caused overland flooding to wipe out an entire community. But that community was ultimately compensated and people had to build their houses higher and that was all taken care of. Um, but what they never did was they never truly said why they did what they did. And uh, I think that's what people have the hardest time um, is if you're going to flood people out on purpose, tell them and tell them why. And in this case, they didn't, so they, people lost, a lot of people lost everything. Now, if they had told them that it was going to happen, they could have got stuff out. Um, and the reason they did it is they sacrificed, say, a, a hundred homes for the greater good. Uh, the floodway was getting right to its capacity, or was at, at its capacity, or maybe even above. And 
they had to decide whether to allow more water to go through Winnipeg or spill water off somewhere. And they never admitted that they did it to save Winnipeg because if they had let the additional water go through Winnipeg, it would have caused flooding of businesses, hundreds of businesses, thousands of homes. And who knows how many millions of dollars damage. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions even. Now, I think if they said, look, we understand this is your home, we're sorry, but you know, these hundred houses unfortunately have to be sacrificed to save all these people in Winnipeg and compensate them fairly for it. I think that's the big thing, is you have to compensate the people for their losses. You know, you're, you're throwing them under the bus. At least tell them, tell them why. Um, If I was in the flood zone and it was determined that my house had to be sacrificed, there was two things that I would want. One, I would want notice and I could get things out. And two, I'd want to know why. If they said, came to me and said, you know, Bob, if we flood your house, we can save the rest of the town. Or we can save ten houses. Or five houses. But you're going to lose your home. But we will compensate you to have, have it rebuilt and replace things that are lost. I would be very upset. But I would be very understanding. And I would accept it. Readily. Now that Elf Workington retired a few years back, and when we had the flood in 2011, he came back to help. They asked him back to come and help because the guys that were working for him that took over only had between, I think, six months and three years experience doing this. And One of the things they were missing is a good system to track everything. So by doing it his way, it was older and antiquated, and he had he had told them that he needed a better system. They had to manually enter data from various flood basins that fed into the rivers that caused the problems here. Uh, a new software or an upgraded system, they could... Damn, he's trying to walk across the highway. You get that a lot this time of year. Um, anyway, the whole system was, needs to be upgraded, and he has said that. And two years ago, they called him back to help. And they didn't listen to him anyway, and that's when the houses and cottages got flooded on the Assiniboine River, and they unnecessarily flooded a farmer's, several farmers' fields, and wiped out the livelihoods for a, a year or two of some, like, strawberry farms and various places like that that they didn't recover. There's a couple of campgrounds that were wiped out that never reopened. Um, and he had said they didn't need to do what they had done there, and that was basically breaching a bank on the river at a low spot where it could fill, you know, they could use some farmer's fields as, as a, a storage for a lot of water. Now, here we are, 2013. <coughs> These rookies are saying this is how things are going to happen. They're saying the Red River is going to be devastating, but the Cinnaboyne River is not going to be too bad, 
or it's going to be bad, but not real bad. Well, the Red River comes up from Fargo, North Dakota, that direction, Fargo, Grand Forks. They don't have a lot of ground cover left. It's going. They are going to have flooding, but their forecast isn't bad, bad. And the overland flooding for us isn't apparently going to be quite that bad because the snow is going on the flat fields, starting to. But the Cinnaboyne, where these rookies said that things are going to be just fine, um, flows from Saskatchewan, who has an abnormally large amount of snow this year. And it flows through Manitoba, from Saskatchewan to Winnipeg, through areas that haven't a large amount of snow this year. So it is going to be bad. So they've got it completely backwards. And he actually apparently went in and talked to, went to talk to the people saying, I think your guys are wrong and I'm, I'll, I'll help because, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's a skill that you acquire. You don't just jump in and do it. And, you know, he's got all these years of experience. Let him help. Listen to the man. You didn't last time, and look what happened. It's happening again, and you're not listening. Well, this time, he went in, and they basically told him to stop where he was, made a quick phone call, and had him escorted off the premises. So, he's gone public. Basically, not really big, but he's basically made it known that he offered and was unceremoniously uh, walked out and you know, told to take a hike, so to speak. Now, what'll happen if it proves that he is right again? You know, should those rookies keep their jobs? I think so. I think they have to learn, and the only way you're going to learn is doing it. And the experience is where you get that. Now, should the higher-ups that basically didn't listen to him last time keep their jobs, the same ones that had him escorted off the property this time? No, they shouldn't. Not only should they lose their jobs, maybe they should lose their pension, Although that is something that they personally paid in, but being a government pension, the government usually matches what you put in for your pension contributions. So maybe they should lose the, the part that's put in for them and just kick them to the curb and say, you know what, you're out of here. And maybe make them liable for some of the damage, you know? They're not just playing with water overflowing a curb into someone's yard and maybe overland flooding into a pool so they have to have their pool skimmed and cleaned and everything. They're dealing with people's lives here. and Our flooding here does get quite bad, but one good thing is we seldom lose lives. And I mean seldom. Usually if we lose lives because of the flooding, it's kids playing in the fast-flowing fast waters, which is never a good thing. Um, that's usually what causes the losses, which is not good. Um, it does happen. Um, I can't remember. I think it was two years ago. The first year that we had a STARS... Uh, air ambulance, a helicopter, um, for Winnipeg and surrounding area. There was a young boy who actually fell in the water, got sucked into a culvert or something, I think, and drowned. Um, and apparently he was underwater for 30 or 40 minutes. And they were able to get him out. And by the time they got him out, the STARS 
air ambulance with paramedics was there. And this was a rural area. And they were able to revive him, get him back, and the kid's doing well. Because the water was cold enough that it slowed everything down for his metabolism. Now, I'm in a hurry, and there's not going to be any spots to park here. Are there? Nope. Wave that guy out. Anyway, oh good, I'll take his spot. He just pulled out. We're pulling in. I'll take it. And uh, I'm a 30 second run because I'm running late for my appointment otherwise. And uh, we'll be back. Take it easy. Have a good one.